Revelation chapter 3. Um, we had an interesting time Wednesday night down in um, Harrison, Arkansas. I really, I really did. I really felt like I prayed about it and I just couldn't get away from it. I <clears throat> had talked to uh, Pastor Mike Hutzel down there on two different occasions prior to going down there. And I said, Mike, I said, is there anything that you want me to particularly speak on? He said, no, just follow the Lord's will. I said, Mike, that's dangerous to tell me that. Don't tell me that. Give me, give me, a, give me a goal to look for. I said, you know, I speak on a lot of things. And he said, you just mind the Lord. And I said, well, okay. And I did it a second time. He said, just whatever the Lord tells you. So we get to the church and uh, we parked in the church parking lot right next to the back door there. And he saw us pull in. So he come over and sat and visited for us a while. And I said, Mike, now, are, is there anything you want me to speak on tonight? Any particular thing? He said, no, just follow the Lord's will. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure the Lord's going to have me speak about UFOs. And I, and I just kind of gave him the small version of what I was going to say. It's very simple, just some very simple things out of the scriptures. And, uh, and I showed him some things and he said, wow, he said, that's that I never thought about that, that before, but you're right. That's pretty interesting. So I had his blessing on it. So I get up in front of the church Wednesday, and I am just nervous. There's a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And um, so I start out, and I ask anybody, has anybody ever seen anything weird? And they, somebody pointed at me. I said, other than me. And uh, nobody did, admitted anything. I asked anybody, have you ever seen any strange lights in the sky, anything like that? Nobody said a word. And I'm going, this is not going to go well. So I went, okay. And I just started in teaching uh, the simplistic version, the most simplistic way I could. And mind you, that church, Harrison Church, we go, I've been speaking there now for uh, over 20 years. And they're all my friends, and I love them dearly. And um, so anyway, I, I, get most, I get pretty much through it. And I said, does anybody have any questions on anything that I just said? Everybody start throwing their hand up. You know, Brother Mike, I saw something years ago out at the edge of my farm. Brother Mike, the other day, I had one of his truck driver. Brother Mike, I saw lights. He said, I used to see them all the time, up in the sky, moving. And he said, I knew they weren't no satellites. I knew they weren't no jets. I knew this, I knew that. And directly, here come one after another, and I'm going. So why didn't you tell me this at the beginning of the sermon? So I wouldn't be so doggone nervous thinking I'm going to get thrown out of here and never invited back ever again. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yep. Yeah. See, now everybody's coming. And see, that was my point that I made Wednesday. From, and I, and I showed a graphic of all these National Enquirer covers from the 70s. And I said, back in the 70s, this is where you got information about UFOs. From the National Enquirer, the Weekly World News. That way, nobody would believe it. I said, but since the New York Times ran its article in 2017, now you've got newspapers covering these every single day. 
And I'm talking about major newspapers, LA Times, New York Times, Washington Post. They're carrying these, and literally around the world, the London, London newspapers, Paris newspapers, Mexican newspapers. Of course, they have a lot of UFO sightings in Mexico, a ton of them. And so you have this stuff going, you, you have now, I, what I said was, we live in a different world than Wally and Beaver grew up in. We live in a different world than Andy and Barney and Aunt B and Opie and Floyd the Barber. We live, this is not the same world. Back in that world, like our mom. Our mom saw one with a, our neighbor lady. They both looked at each other. They went home. I guess, I guess mom would have told dad and dad probably would have told mom, you're drunk. Okay, that was back in the day. And since then, never a word to anybody. But now it's a different world. Two thirds, of the, two thirds of Americans, there's more people in America who believe in UFOs than believe in God anymore. So this is a different world. It is a different country. And not only are the, the sightings increasing, the mainstream reporting on the sightings is increasing. And I believe all of that is for a reason. And then, so if all of these people who see these things, they can't all be lying. And it can't all be swamp gas. It can't all be weather balloons. In fact, the report that the uh, Congress or the Pentagon Department of Defense, they were ordered by an act of Congress signed by President Trump to release documents and release a report on government involvement with UFOs, the 99% the of the report was a joke, an absolute joke, because we know for a fact that they know more than what they're telling. But what they did say was, out of 144 some odd cases that we examined of military encounters with UFOs, we can only explain one of them, which means the 143 of them, we cannot explain how they were able to move the way they were, how they were able to do aeronautically the things they did, how they're able to, de to defy the laws of physics. We do not know where they come from. We do not, we don't, we know that they're not ours. We do not believe that they are the Russians or the Chinese or any other governmental secret access program that goes on anywhere on this earth, but they would not say we believe they could be of extraterrestrial organ, or origin. They never touch that subject whatsoever. But so bare minimum, there was an admittance by your government that yes, we have encountered objects in the sky that in some cases engaged our pilots who were flying training missions or real missions that engaged our pilots that did things that we cannot explain nor could we answer to. In other words, our pilots had no way, number one, of chasing them down or number two, defending themselves against them. No way, no how. So it is a different world. But I, I started out nervous as all get out, nervous during the whole thing, fumbling through my PowerPoints, fumbling through the scriptures. The videos I had to play wouldn't work. And at the end, they were all going, man, that's one of the best things you've ever done. I'm glad you brought that up, Pastor Mike, because, man, we've been wanting to hear, we've been wanting to know what this stuff has been for years. Why didn't you tell me that? All right, Revelation chapter 3. Um, verse 5, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Last week, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but let me run through this very quickly. This issue of the book of life, what it is. 
Uh, Philippians 4, 3, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. The book of life, I believe, is the book of those who are saved. That book has been written from the foundation of the earth, God knowing who will be saved and who will not be saved. And incidentally, God wrote the names down of everybody that would be saved before the foundation of the earth. That's how he's God and you're not. Okay? If you were to, if you were to write down for me the next... I'll, I'll, I'll give you this one. If you can write down for me and put, and put your life savings as an addition to it, saying, here's my life savings... And this is who is going to be president in 2024. Any takers? Because there's always that chance you're going to be wrong, no matter what. Okay? But God has written our names in the book of life. He always knows who is saved, who isn't saved, who is going to be saved, and so on. And in that sense, don't ever give up on anybody being saved. Don't ever give up. Some people make deathbed confessions, and yes, I believe that. We had a lady in this church years ago, and I'm talking about the 80s, when I was a teenager, and she was talking to me one time. Dear, sweet lady, I loved her to death, but she said, brother, I don't believe in deathbed confessions. And I'm going, well, the thief on the cross wasn't necessarily laying in his bed, but he confessed, and he's in heaven now. So, okay, so maybe you have to hang on a cross to get that. But I'm telling you, I believe in him. So don't ever give up on anybody. Amen? Um, let me move on here. Uh, we know in Revelation 20, verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Remember, that's the book of their works. The things that they both did and thought. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And that's the thing. Lost people get judged according to their works. Saved people get judged on the basis of their faith, not their works. Amen? Uh, we've in stores, in and out of Branson yesterday, in these different stores, and they sell a lot of patriotic stuff, a lot of military stuff. Um, that's where I bought my Blue Lives Matter hat down there. Got a lot of comments from people on that. I got a lot of people, as I walked by, said, I like your hat. I appreciate that. But anyway, um, where is I going with that? I lost my... Oh, um, there was a, a, a t-shirt that said, always faithful. Well, that's the Marine logo, Semper Fi. Semper Fi is Latin for always faithful. And I thought, you know, that'd be a good sermon to preach one of these days. Semper Fi. And I believe that those who are truly born again are Semper Fi. They are always faithful. Their flesh may not go along with God's plan, but they're not saved by what their flesh does or does not do. My flesh does not want to be here today. Absolutely does not want to be here today. But my spirit, my soul does. Semper Fi. Always faithful. Amen? Uh, and that's what that is. And so they are going to be judged by their works. We're not. We're judged according to our faith. Uh, they were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Revelation 20, verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, uh, let's go to Psalm 69, because we're going to jump to a place, another place in the book of Psalms. I'll explain uh, just, just for another, another angle of the book of life. Psalm 69. And I love this kind of stuff right here. 
Psalm 69. By the way, got homecoming next Sunday, next weekend. I am totally, 100%, not ready. <laughs> Psalm 69, verse 25. Well, I've spent the last week trying to figure out how to make those Arkansas hillbillies believe from the Bible that, yes, what they saw up in the sky was both real and I know what they are according to the word of God. That's, where I've spent, that's how I've spent my week last week. Psalm 69, 25. Let their habitation, let's back up a little bit. Uh, this is to the Jews. Uh, let's see here. If you go back to verse 1, Save me, O God, for the waters are coming into my soul. I sink in deep mire where no... Uh, where is no standing? I come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I'm weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me being mine enemies wrongfully. Being my enemies wrongfully. If you'll live such a life as that you do no wrong to somebody. And if you just happen to wrong somebody, which it's entirely possible to do, even as Christians, Go back to them, apologize, and make that right. God will honor that. God will bless that. And it takes, it takes swallowing a lot of pride and eating a lot of crow. That's what it takes. But it can be done and it should be done in as much as it is possible. It can be done. Pastor Kelly preached a message years ago called When Dogs Bark. And it has to do with former sins that you committed against people where uh, you may have offended them at one point or uh, you sinned against them. And uh, then there was another one called Take Ye Away of the Stone. And it was about the stone that they had rolled in front of the tomb of, of Lazarus. And notice that Jesus didn't say, excuse me, while I remove this stone. He didn't put it there. They did. And he talked about how we put, we lay stone of stumblings in front of people, rock of offenses in front of people. And this is why, they, this is why they're not ever coming to church with you. You can, invite, you can invite them to all the services you want to. They're not coming. Because in some cases, you rolled a stone of offense in front of them. They saw you at your worst one day, and they didn't understand that, yes, you still have a sin nature, but they saw you and they said, well, if that's how that church is, I ain't ever going. And he preached that one time. And I was at Reg's dinner table one time and I told him that when I was in uh, 11th grade, may have even been a senior, the jazz band, I played in the school jazz band and the, uh, we were working with the Honor Society kids. They were having a, uh, a PTA dinner for the parents and for the teachers. And the Honor Society was serving the food and our jazz band was out in the lobby playing music as people came in. They had a break, they come out, we played music, they went back in and then we were done. Somebody found the closet, the storage room where they keep all the concessions for all the basketball and football games, the candy bars, the chips and all that stuff. And they were, everybody was diving into it. And I fell into that. And my, my thing back then was Snickers bars. I love Snickers bars. And it ended up stealing two Snickers bars. So I ate one. Don't uh, at me. I got stuff on you. So she's going, what stuff? So anyway, I ate one. And driving home, the Holy Ghost is dealing, dealing with me all the way home. What are you going to do, Mike? You going to eat that? You going to eat that other candy bar? You going to enjoy that now? Because that, I know where you got it from. I know you stole it. You going to eat it? I'd be afraid I'd choke on it if I were you and I were smart. And I mean, God's just whipping me to death all the way home, driving all the way home. So I took that thing, flung it out the window, and I said, I don't want anything to do with it. Huh? 
You know what Reg said to me? Now that's 19, that was 1983. Here comes Reg Kelly, 2010, saying, did you ever go back and make that right to them? Do what? He said, you know, it wouldn't hurt you for you to walk in that school with two candy bars and say, I stole these, 1983. <laughs> because they, did, they didn't know who to get. If the National Honor Society, they were blaming them, but they were blaming the jazz band as well. And come to find out, all of us, National Honor Society and the jazz band got in on it. They ended up losing, I don't know how much money in concessions that night. I mean, they probably hundreds of dollars was stolen that night. And uh, he did, he asked me, he said, did you ever go back and make that right? And I said, well, no. He said, you would be surprised at how God would honor that. I've never forgot that. I haven't taken the candy bars back over there, but I never forgot it. Anyway, let their habitation be desolate. Psalm 69, verse 25. And let none, so this is who this is about. Let their habitation be desolate. Let none dwell in their tents. Let the, for they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. And they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness and let them be blotted out of the book of sea, blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. This is, there's prophecies here concerning Christ on the cross. And all of those who took part, not only in swinging the hammer, the hammer to the nails, but also to those who participated and said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And this is what God says to them. He says, let, uh, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Written with the righteous means your name is written in the book of life. Now, I do believe it's possible that there is a book of the living. And upon your death, it's just like a, you have a birth certificate and death certificate. It announces your birth, but it also signifies and certifies that you are in fact now dead. And that's all legal stuff because a lot of things then start taking place the moment you're born. So there has to be a record of it. And then there is a record of death and all sorts of legal things must take place the moment you're dead. Bank accounts have to be transferred. Uh, life insurance has to be paid. Just all kinds of tons of stuff have to be done when someone dies. So blot, let them be blotted out of the book of living. Now, let's turn to Psalm 139. Here is, here is a version of God's book of life. God's book of the living. Thine eyes did see, and I'm going to give you a, a shortened version of this as well, but I, I've been so long since I've talked about DNA. But here it is right here in plain sight. This, this was some 3,000 years ago when this was written. I mean, men understood the idea of a man going into a woman and they understood that seed was produced. But beyond that, they didn't understand it. They didn't have a, a, any knowledge of what that was. They just understood the, the very basics of it. And like I said, everything that we know about DNA is about 60 to 70 years old. 90% of what we know about DNA is 10 years old. 5% of what we know today about DNA is about a two to three years old. And they're still learning more about it. But it's described this way in your Bible. Verse 16, Psalm 139. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. 
And in thy book, all my members were written. Now understand that it was not understood that DNA was laid out in book form until at least the early to mid to late 90s, somewhere in the 90s, they started seeing then that the code of DNA was not just some mumbled, jumbled thing that your body somehow made sense out of. They actually found out that when they figured out that the three codons, I'll explain that in a minute, when they formed together to make an amino acid, and those amino acids in, in, certain, uh, in, in, in a certain order created a protein in your body that did something in your body, they also discovered how to figure out how to find each one of those proteins. They looked for what's called a start protein and a stop protein or a stop, a start codon and a stop codon. A, when we start a sentence, what's the first thing we do with the first letter of the sentence? We capitalize the letter. That signifies the beginning of a new sentence. When we end the sentence which the Apostle Paul very seldom ever did. If you've ever read Paul in any of his letters, he's got, he's got sentences that are 12 verses long. But at the end of a sentence, we signify it by putting a period at the end of it. Your DNA has a start codon. It's a recognizable genetic sequence that the readers of DNA know this is where a new gene starts and they know where the gene ends because there's what's called a stop codon. It has a capital letter at the beginning of the sentence and it has a period at the end of the sentence just like a book. And you have a machine in your body called RNA polymerase that travels up and down the ladder of DNA, reading it constantly, looking for proteins that need to be made to keep your body alive. Your, you have your heart, that cells are dying off of your heart. Well, new cells need to be produced. So right now, your body is in the process of reading the relevant DNA parts that produce the proteins and then it gives the instructions on how those proteins are to be folded together to make the heart tissue that keeps your heart fresh and beating every day of your life. Blood cells need to be made. So there's DNA that's being read Non-stop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week that are making the things that are required to make new red blood cells, white blood cells that fight off disease. DNA is being read constantly to make white blood cells to keep fighting off diseases in your body. And here's the miracle of it. I've heard some preachers say, well, the word must be read, but the word must also be applied, which means that you must perform what God said. I don't know about that. I think if you read the word and believe the word, the word does in you what you are not able to do yourself, is what I believe. I believe God's book is quick and powerful in that 
God doesn't need my help to do the things necessary in my life to keep me going in this world. Usually, if I try to step in to what I think needs to be done in my life to keep me going in God's world, that's usually where the mistakes start taking place and bad stuff starts happening. I make a mess of things very quickly. It's the story of my life. Okay? I don't like it, but it is the story of my life. So anyway, he said, Then eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, DNA is a book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. I will put that in picture form for you. In thy book, all my members were written. Your eyes, some of you have pretty toes, and some of you have got the awfulest looking feet of any human being. It's the reason why you don't wear sandals. Amen? The mouth, your underarm, your muscles, your arm, your skin, your, your ugly elbows, your fingers, those are all members that were written by the Word of God that you're going to have those when you started out, when you started out as a single-celled organism in your mother's womb. Did you have to apply the DNA and hook your own arm up as a baby in your mother's womb in order for you to have an arm when you were born? No. Did you have to make your own heart following the instructions? Because if you did, it's typical to anything that we build that we have to follow instructions from, there's always leftover parts, aren't they? And we always tell our wives, well, they throw in extra screws, dear. They always do that. And then a few months later, we find out, oh, that's where that screw went. Because <laughs> something fell off. In that book, all my members were written. A family. A body. A family is a body, is it not? The husband, the wife, the children, that is a body, a family body. A church is as well. The writers of the Gospels, they were the part of the body of Christ. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned. Because not only were they getting saved at Pentecost, they got saved the day after Pentecost, they got saved the month after Pentecost, a year after Pentecost, 500 years after Pentecost and 2,000 years after Pentecost, people are still being saved. Somebody say amen. And God knew it. He had their name, George, written in the book. He had your name written in his book on the day of Pentecost. He had your name written in the book. Knowing you were going to be saved. Knowing what he was going to do in your life. He knew it. Even though you hadn't showed up then. I always attribute it to like when I was seven and eight years old. In fact, I'll tell this story. When I was about four years old, I used to stand and watch my dad shave. With one of those single blade they should be outlawed razors. You know, you twist the bottom, the thing opened up, you put the single blade razor in, you twist it back up. And I used to watch my dad shave. And mom used to get on to my dad saying, you better put that razor up. Well, why? Your son watches you, and on one of these days, he's going to cut himself. Oh, he ain't going to do that. So sure enough, after he went... To work, I went in there and I grabbed that razor and it only took once. And I've got a scar on my face right here 
from that all those years ago. Okay? But, where was I going with that? In continuance was fashioned. That means the members of our bodies. Anyway, at four years old, I didn't need to shave. But in my genes, there was something that when I hit about 12, 13, 14 years old, that triggered the DNA in my body to start putting chunks of really nasty, ugly hair on my chin and on my lip. And I didn't want it there. So I remember the first time I had to start shaving all of that off. And I didn't tell that to grow. I didn't make that grow. You know what it was? It was prophesied in my DNA that at a certain age, all this hair is going to start growing off of my face. And see, what I'm here to tell you is, you have no idea as yet what God has planned for you in this book. But if it's in your book, I guarantee you, God's going to do it and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Somebody say amen. Father, bless your word. Bless these people. We thank you, dear Father, for the wonderful, wondrous works of God. Father, help us, each and every one of us that are watching today. It is our responsibility to make sure that our names are written in the book of life. Yes, it's one thing to work for others and to strive that others be saved. But unless our name is written in the book of life, it'll be for naught when it comes to us standing before you in judgment. So bless us and show us, Father, that we can know that our names are written in your book of life. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name, all of God's people said.